Eh, buenos días a todos, bienvenidos una vez más a una de nuestras sesiones de seminario. Eh, voy a hablar en inglés por, eh, para que nuestro invitado de hoy, que igual sabe español, ¿ya? pero tiene, tendría que irse, ir ajustando la oreja, tendríamos que ir un poco más despacio, pero lo voy a, lo voy a presentar en inglés. Uh, our guest today is Vincent Lynch at Buffalo uh, University at Buffalo. Uh, I I'm a fan of Vincent, Vincent's research. Uh, he's always doing some very exciting stuff. He pioneered uh, Evo Devo studies about the reversion from, ovi, from viviparity to oviparity in reptiles. He has done some very important publications, contributions also about the evolution of viviparity, uh, right? The placenta as a as an inflammation response, uh, a very sophisticated <laughs> inflammatory response. And we were, we were co-workers in Gunter Wagner's lab during my postdoc, during which time Vincent was incredibly useful to me. <laughs> I would always <laughs> consult with him a lot and just speak generally in science because it's always an interesting conversation with, with Vini. And uh, I've, I've had a lot of discussions with people lately about this de-extinction thing. And it, it so happens that Vini is one of the people that has actually made some experiments with mammoth genes, one of the people that have actually worked on this in a more uh, serious manner. So I'd say, okay, this is a, this is a great opportunity uh, to invite uh, Vini to, to speak. So, is really a, a great guest. I'm very happy that we can finally have him after a few accidents we had <laughs> along, along the way that are natural to paternity, to the complexities of, of parenting. <laughs> Vini has a, a, a nine month baby. So, but I'm glad that we could reconvene and have this seminar after all. So uh, with great pleasure, I introduce to you uh, Vincent Lynch. Thanks, Alex. It was a very kind introduction. I do miss sort of our conversations back in the, the Wagner lab because they could go pretty wild into interesting <laughs> places in biology, which is always fun, right? You always want someone to, to speculate wildly about sort of what biologists, evolutionary biologists do, this sort of, you know, hand-waving and storytelling. So, you know, it's always good to have someone to tell evolutionary stories with. Um, <laughs> so today I'm going to mostly talk about some work that we've done on mammoths, obviously, and um, I don't mind being interrupted during the talk. Uh, I tend to talk fast as I get excited. So the more, I, the, the further the talk goes in, I might start talking faster and faster. And if I misspeak and something doesn't make sense, just tell me to stop and, and repeat it. I, I don't mind at all. Um, so in case you haven't thought about uh, elephants and mammoth biology in a while, um, the living and extinct elephants uh, originated in re relatively warm places, right? So we think they originated in sort of warm equatorial Africa around five to 10 million years ago. So here I mean the, the actual elephants, not probobsidians, so not like mastodons and the like. Um, so in this case, elephants and, and uh, well, yeah, the ancestral elephants uh, originated in, in warm Africa and then migrated out from Africa uh, into Eurasia. So there, there are lots of Asian elephant populations throughout Eurasia and extinct elephant populations in Europe. The woolly mammoths colonized the sort of high latitude mammoth steppe or uh, tundra about 2 million years ago, right? So mammoths are uh, only relatively recent inhabitants of these cold high Arctic places. So they only colonized it recently, but their range in the Arctic is quite extensive. So it, it, their ranges go all the way from, from uh, Eastern Europe through Northern Russia, through Beringia, into North America, and then down into North America. Um, so they colonized and then took over relatively rapidly. So they're one of the, uh, if you, at least if you think about per population size, they're one of the most abundant of the sort of classic place to see megafauna. Unfortunately, if you're like me and you find mammoths really interesting to work on, almost all the woolly mammoth populations were extinct by about 5,000 years ago. So it looks like mammoth populations, while they fluctuate through time with environmental changes, uh, particularly during the Pleistocene when you get these cycles happening of warm and cold, uh, warm and cold. Um, on the mainland, 
uh, most woolly mammoth populations were probably functionally extinct by 15,000 years ago, even though there probably were a few small isolated populations. The last populations of mammoths uh, inhabited Wrangell Island in the far north of the Arctic Circle and a small island in the Bering Sea called St. Paul Island. Uh, and these were, the, as far as we know, the last sustainable populations, and both of them went extinct around 5,000 years ago. Uh, the causes of the extinction are not quite clear. So in Wrangell Island, apparently the mammoths had been living on Wrangell Island for a while. Their populations were small, but at least it was relatively sustainable because um, population size seemed to have been relatively stable until about 5,000 years ago, and they go extinct relatively rapidly. On St. Paul Island, it looks like the mammoth populations went extinct as sea levels rose, uh, which caused most of the fresh water sources on St. Paul Island to become contaminated with seawater. Uh, so that really changed the ecology, including the availability of fresh water to drink. Um, so when we think about extinction of the mammoths, uh, it's debated about what the role that humans played. Humans may have played some role in extinction of the continental populations, but it seems like the very last of the mammoths on these islands went extinct because of ecological factors. Um, for much of the year and almost the entire evolutionary history of mammoths, they lived in extremely cold places. So in the, the upper panel, what I'm showing is the average sur sea surface temperature um, from around the present to about 45,000 years ago. And you can see it's cold, but also there's significant fluctuations during the Pleistocene. So uh, we know that there were uh, relatively rapid and dramatic shifts between a cold environment and a warm environment for much of the Pleistocene. So the Pleistocene isn't necessarily, uh, we think about it as the ice age, um, it isn't necessarily characterized by stable cold environments, but rapidly oscillating environments between the cold and the warm. Until around 15,000 years ago, uh, when the world starts to get sort of warm and stable. And this is about when mammoths start to go extinct. Uh, so once the environment shifts to a relatively warm, stable one, mammoths populations decline and, and go extinct. And if you look about, if you look on a sort of a world map about, uh, this is current data, so it'd be a little colder in the Pleistocene, uh, about what the temperatures that were lived, you know, they tended to inhabit these northern high latitude places where it was really cold most of the year, right? So for most of their evolutionary history and much of the year in which they lived, mammoths inhabited these very, very cold places. And it was relatively dark during the winter, right? So even during the Pleistocene, it was probably a little darker than modern populations. So uh, in this map, I'm showing the um, average amount of sunlight that hits the earth during winter. And you can see that the darker blue colors are the darker ones. So in the high Arctic, where mammoths mostly lived, it was relatively dark in winter, uh, obviously north of the Arctic Circle. As you get closer to the Arctic Circle, um, it gets darker and darker. So it was cold and it was relatively dark, um, but it was not particularly snowy. So during the Pleistocene, the places where mammoths lived um, in the high Arctic uh, are characterized by a relatively stable high pressure system that was basically parked over the, the northern latitudes. Um, and high pressure systems are associated with relatively nice weather. Um, so while it was really cold and really dark, it actually wasn't that snowy. Now, obviously there was snow, but this high pressure system basically kept uh, what we might think of as blizzard conditions at bay. And the paleo environment that mammoths lived in was relatively diverse, right? So uh, there were mammoths, there were lots of other Pleistocene megafauna, uh, like the woolly rhino in the new world. We had, um, different kinds of, of felids, uh, American lions, saber-toothed tigers. Uh, in the new world, there were lots of horses running around at this point. Um, so the environment was quite diverse and it might not be what we mostly think of when we think of like that sort of cold um, uh, caveman-like environments. Um, so it was cold, it was very cold, tended to be dark during the winter uh, and it was much like the, the tundra is now, except there were more trees in the lake. So to live in this environment, obviously mammoths evolved a, a whole bunch of traits that support life in these extreme cold conditions. And when you look at a mammoth, these are the traits that make a mammoth a mammoth and not an elephant. Um, so here are just some of the traits that make mammoths mammoths and distinguishable from an Asian elephant, their closest living relative. Uh, so molecular studies have shown that the hemoglobin of mammoths has a few amino acid differences from uh, 
the hemoglobin of the other elephants. And those amino acid changes are important for um, allowing hemoglobin to function efficiently at cold temperatures. So they had cold tolerant hemoglobin. Woolly mammoths are relatively small, but other mammoths are, you know, Mammoths are big, obviously. Uh, woolly mammoths are a little bit smaller than some of the other mammoths. Um, so like the Colombian mammoth was a very, very large animal. Uh, and these large body sizes in general uh, are associated with cold environments uh, because they help you conserve heat. So they have a, a relatively large body size. Similar for other animals that live in cold environments, they seem to have had uh, relatively large fat deposits, not quite blubber, but, but fat. And one of the more interesting kinds of fat that they seem to have are adult brown fat deposits. So brown fat is a kind of fat which is thermogenic. It generates heat by being relatively metabolically active. Um, it actually looks brown if you look at it because it's full of mitochondria. Mitochondria are brown in color. And in most mammals, brown fat is common uh, from birth to around weaning or so. And after, after mammals wean, they lose a lot of their fat. And the reason that infant mammals have fat, have brown fat, is to, uh, it's for its thermogenic capacity, right? It helps keep uh, neonates warm. Um, brown fat deposits in adults are not that common. There are small ones in humans, for example. In mammoths, it looks like they had a, a hump uh, on the back of their shoulders and between their shoulder blades that was a brown fat deposit, probably analogous to a camel's hump, which may have helped them um, both store calories that they accumulate during the, the sort of relative abundance of the summer months to get them through the relative paucity of uh, caloric intake during the winter months. Um, it probably also allowed them to generate a little more heat during winter. Um, if you live in the Arctic, you probably wanna have uh, short ears and tails. Lots of things that live in cold environments have small ears and tails um, because you know, think about the, the African elephant with its huge ears. Ears are basically radiators for heat. So it looks like that mammoths evolved relatively small ears and tails to conserve heat. Uh, obviously, woolly mammoths are woolly. It looks like their hair had um, two kinds of coats, like a dog that might have two kinds of coats. There was a, a, an overcoat, which is long hair, and then an undercoat, which is very um, sort of woolly. It's much thicker and it's much denser. And obviously these likely played roles in helping mammoths conserve body heat. Uh, it also looks like mammoths had um, Really large and com uh, really large and frequent sebaceous glands in their skin, which is something that Asian elephants and African elephants um, they have sebaceous glands, but they're not as commonly observed in the skin as they are in woolly mammoths. It's been speculated that you know all these sweat glands play a role in uh, conditioning the fur to be better at maintaining uh, at maintaining warmth, and it. At least some evidence indicates that that woolly mammoths had a, a slightly higher body temperature um, than other animals. And we, the reason that we can infer all of these things is because we don't just have a rock record for mammoths. We actually find mammoth tissues preserved in uh, permafrost, for example. So we can find the brown fat. We can find the fat deposits. Um, we can see their small ears and tails, and we can use um, uh, isotopic analysis of their tusks, for example, to try to get a, uh, an indication of what their body temperatures were. And also we can do histology on their skin to see their sebaceous glands. Um, and along with cold tolerant hemoglobin and just generally higher body temperatures, uh, we think that there were probably many more physiological traits that, we, that, that helped mammoths adapt to their sort of cold, dark environments that we can't observe because they're not living anymore. Many of these physiological traits, while they're obviously likely to be genetically encoded, uh, we only might be able to observe in living organisms. So there are these macroscopic traits which help uh, mammoths adapt to the high Arctic. And then there are a bunch of physiological traits which likely also help to uh, mammoths adapt to the, the extreme cold of the high Arctic. Um, I'm a sort of, uh, molecular minded person who thinks about the relationship between genetic changes and morphological changes. So from my perspective, the really interesting questions here are what are the genetic changes that underlie the evolution of these cold adapted traits in brain animals? So to try to get at that, um, my collaborators and I sequenced and compared the genomes of an African savanna elephant, three Asian elephants, and then three woolly mammoths. Now, now there's many more woolly mammoth genomes, but at the time there were only three or five. 
uh, available depending on how you count. So we could sequence these genomes and then just use tools of genome comparison to identify genetic changes unique to the woolly mammoths. And at least some of those genetic changes are gonna be associated with woolly mammoth traits. Very many of those genetic changes are not gonna be associated with anything because they're functionally neutral, but at least some of them will be. And when we do these genome comparisons, we identified about 7 million changes, 7 million nucleotide changes that are fixed within the woolly mammoths compared to the, the elephants. Uh, these samples are obviously from degraded ancient DNA samples. So we're clearly doing, an, uh, in, in these comparisons, we're clearly underestimating the total number of genetic changes between Asian elephants and, and woolly mammoths, for example, um, just because those, uh, a lot of those genetic changes are gonna occur in regions of the genome that we haven't been able to sequence because they're not there anymore, or they're so degraded that we can't reliably infer what the sequence was, or if we even have the sequence and can infer what it was, we can't reliably say that the woolly mammoth change is unique to the woolly mammoths compared to the Asian elephants. And these are just some of the problems that you have uh, when you're working with degraded ancient samples. So it's clearly an underestimate. Even with that underestimate though, we were able to identify 3,193 protein coding changes that are fixed within the woolly mammoths compared to the, the other elephants. So this is a 3,100, fixed amino acid changes that are unique to the woolly mammoth genome. If we think that at least some of the woolly mammoth specific traits are because of woolly mammoth genetic changes in proteins, these are a good set of putatively candidate genes that might be responsible for woolly mammoth specific traits. Um, obviously, there's going to be a lot of, you know, almost all of the other 7 million genetic changes that occur elsewhere in the genome. And many of those are probably neutral. They don't actually have any effect on uh, the genotype phenotype relationship between mammoths and uh, or that are specific for mammoth derived traits. Uh, and at least some of those might be functional and they might be functional in things like cis regulatory elements for protein coding genes or in link RNAs or in micro RNAs. So today I'm not gonna discuss any of those changes. I'm just gonna focus on the amino acid substitutions that are unique to woolly mammoths and what those, the function of those changes might be. So what are the functions of these genes? There are lots of ways that you can get at that. Um, so right now we just, at, at this point in the, the research, we just have a list. We have a list of actually an Excel file basically that has the gene and for each gene, uh, genes in rows and amino acid changes in columns, we can line up our rows and columns and say, here's a gene, here's the genetic change. Here's the gene, here's the genetic change that are unique to woolly mammoth. So you end up with the list of genes that have woolly mammoth specific substitutions. And these gene lists are useful, uh, but they're only so useful. So what can you do with them? Well, one of the things that you can do is say, are these genes with woolly mammoth specific changes, amino acid substitutions, enriched in any particular function? And there are lots of different pathways and ontologies that one can use to, to link genes with known functions and say, do a statistical test to ask whether these genes with woolly mammoth specific substitutions are enriched in these pathways. Alternatively, you can say, well, it's not the pathway that we care about, it's the, the uh, organismal phenotype that we care about. So we can also ask, are these genetic changes that are unique to woolly mammoths in their protein coding genes, enriched in particular mammalian phenotypes that we can observe in knockout mice. Um, both of these uh, make a bunch of assumptions, but these are, the, these are the kinds of assumptions that are relatively common to doing these kinds of studies. And for most of the time, in most of the cases, these assumptions are likely to be valid. So for example, one assumption is that the function of a gene in mammoths is gonna be the same as the function of the gene in, in mouse, for example. Uh, some genes will evolve new functions and those will lead to functional differences between human and mouse. Uh, maybe there's a gene involved in some aspect of you know, mouse biology that doesn't play the same role in mammoth biology. So we simplify those assumptions and assume that uh, if a, a, a gene has a known function in mouse, it probably plays a similar role in elephants. So then we can ask, are there woolly mammoth specific substitutions that are enriched in particular mouse phenotypes? Um, and when you do that, you find, yes, of course, uh, there's a lot of them. So if you do math, there's 667 mouse knockout phenotypes 
that have enriched functions in uh, genes with woolly mammoth specific amino acid changes and you can uh, do math to try to control for you know, multiple hypothesis discovery and the like. Um, these are some of those. So um, that would also be a relatively long list. So to try to make the list a little more interesting, I'm showing at least some of those phenotypes as a word cloud. And the word cloud is just a way of showing a list uh, as a figure. Uh, in this case, uh, a bunch of genes with woolly mammoth specific amino acid changes are enriched in nervous system phenotypes when you make a mouse that has a knockout for those genes and are enriched in behavioral neurological phenotypes. This represents the so words this size have an enrichment about this value. So the, the bigger the term, the more enriched the function is. So most genes with woolly mammoth specific amino acid changes have a nervous system phenotype. Many fewer genes have a nervous system phenotype related to abnormal neuronal migration. Um, so you can probably see there's a lot of neuronal stuff here, but if you look a little more closely, then you start to see some really interesting neuronal like, like things. So these terms that I'm highlighting in blue and sort of um, asking the others in gray uh, are related to things that we might think are, are important for living in a cold environment, like an increased thermal nociceptive threshold. So this is the, the threshold at which temperature causes pain. Uh, hypoglesia, which is the, a reduced sensation of pain. Um, abnormal thermal nociception. So in this case, this is the ability uh, to sense the temperature of the environment. Uh, abnormal body temperature. Well, that's actually a really nice one because we think that mammoths probably had a different body temperature than the Asian elephants and, and African elephants. Um, and abnormal pain thresholds. Um, so there's a lot of nervous system stuff. And if you look to see what genes with mana specific amino acid changes are enriched, and then there's a bunch of things that look like they're related to the ability of mammals, or at least mouse, uh, to sense the temperature of the environment and how they respond to that temperature of the environment. And these data at least suggest that mammoths, which have mutations in these genes, um, might have altered the, the way that they sense the environment or respond to the way that they sense the environment. And these gene lists are nice, um, and these associations are nice, but we can never really do the kinds of experiments that we want to do because there are no mammoths. So we can't do like traditional forward and reverse genetics in mouse, for example, and knock in sort of the, let's say, wo a woolly mammoth specific substitution into the Asian elephant gene, uh, Asian elephant genome, and look to see if Asian elephants that incorporate that mammoth specific amino acid substitution have a different preference for temperatures, right? Uh, there are practical reasons. That would be a really hard experiment to do. You'd need a, a herd of elephants. Um, and elephants live a long time. So it would be many generations. You know, elephants live 40, 50 years. So it'd be a lot of generations before we can do that. Um, so these, these kinds of associations are uh, circumstantial, but they start to get us to connecting those genetic changes in mammoths with specific phenotypes. And it raises the obvious question is, can we infer um, if any of these woolly mammoth specific changes are related to mammoths evolving different thermal sensing abilities? Because there's a lot of changes, uh, there's a lot of phenotypes that are related to temperature biology. Um, and among those genes, so there's a lot of genes related to temperature biology, and at least some of those genes are these things we call thermotrips or thermotrps. Uh, uh, let's see, the, this year or last year, the people who discovered the thermotrips got the Nobel, right? So these are really important, um, really important proteins because they allow organisms to sense the temperature of their environment. Um, and these proteins, these thermotrips, are all temperature sensitive calcium channels. So there's a, a whole bunch of these temperature sensitive temperature sensitive calcium channels that sit in the plasma membrane of nerve cells mostly uh, and allow those nerve cells to sense the temperature. And the way they do that is each one of these thermotrip channels responds to a slightly different range of temperatures. So there's the cold temperature sensor, TRPM8. And when temperatures are warm, this channel is not active. As the temperature gets colder and colder, the temperature, uh, as the temperature gets colder and colder, the channel becomes more and more active. Then there's the hot temperature sensor, TRPV2. So conversely, TRPV2 is inactive at low temperatures, but as temperatures become hotter and hotter, it becomes active. So by combinatorial activation of these uh, different thermotrips thermo in uh, neurons, it allows animals to sense the temperature of the environment. 
So if you're an animal inhabiting an environment that's around 30 degrees, your cold temperature sensors are turned off, your hot temperature sensors are turned off, but your warm temperature sensor, TRPV4, is turned on. Um, if you uh, that animal moves into warmer environments, you might get start to get combinatorial activation. So the warm temperature sensor is turned on, and then a different warm temperature sensor is turned on, um, but not the hot temperature sensors. And then as you move in, you move into the hotter and hotter environments, uh, your warm temperature sensors are turning off, and all your hot temperature sensors are turning on. So through the combinatorial activation of these. It allows uh, animals to sense the temperature of their environment. These are also the same temperature sensors which are responsible for the sensation of cold induced by chemicals. Um, so hot chili peppers, uh, the thing that makes them hot is capsaicin. So capsaicin activates the hot temperature sensor, TRPV4. That's why capsaicin and hot chili peppers taste hot. Conversely, things like spearmint and menthol, they're chemical activators of the cold, the, the cold channel. That's why menthol and spearmint have a cooling sensation. So these channels respond to uh, environmental temperature, but they also respond to different kinds of chemicals. Like most um, uh, calcium channels, these things sit in the membrane and they're a tetramer. So this is what one of the tetramers look like. Uh, it's fairly a large uh, protein that sits in the membrane. So this would be the outside of the cell and this would be the inside of the cell. And so here's one monomer, and then here's what the tetramer looks like. Um, so this forms a pore down the center of the tetramer through which calcium can enter the cell. So normally these pores are closed if the channel isn't active. So if this is the cold temperature sensor, if the organism is in a hot environment, the channel is closed, so calcium can't get into the cell. But as the organism moves into colder environments, the channel physically opens and that allows calcium to enter into the cell. And that signaling is what allows the organism to eventually integrate all of that information and say, well, okay, at a molecular level, these channels are opening, it's letting in calcium. Calcium is acting as the, uh, is acting to initiate a response in neurons. And then I, we're sensing the temperature as whatever the temperature is. So these things sit in the membrane of neurons and when they get activated, uh, they allow calcium to influx into the cell, which sets off the signaling cascade, allowing animals to know what temperature they're in. So since we observe that all of these thermotrips have woolly mammoth specific changes, what we wanted to know was whether mammoths respond differently to the kind of environmental temperatures than Asian elephants might. We can't ask that question because mammoths are extinct, but we can do the next best thing, which, at, which is, ask whether the proteins that are responsible for the sensation of temperature function differently in mammoths than they do in elephants. So we, we reduce the organismal question, does the mammoth respond differently to temperature, um, from what we can't actually answer uh, to one we can answer, which is do the proteins that are responsible for mediating the, the sensation of temperature act differently in mammoths than they do, than they do in elephants. Uh, which leads me to a slight digression on this thing called paleogenetics, which is just the idea that if you have enough sequences from living things, you can reconstruct the sequence of uh, ancestral genes. Uh, so this was originally proposed by Linus and Zucker, uh, Linus Pauling and Emil Zucker Candle in 1963. And what they proposed is relatively straightforward. Imagine that you have a phylogeny of living organisms and you know the sequence of their polypeptide genes. So you know the sequence of their proteins. Then you can use the phylogeny and the known sequence to infer the ancestral sequence at deep nodes in the tree for things that are extinct. So for example, if we reconstruct the amino acids at site one for this common ancestor, uh, actually this one's relatively trivial, right? So every species has an alanine at that site. So it's relatively straightforward to say, well, by the principle of parsimony, uh, if everything has an alanine, this common ancestor for these two species probably has an alanine at that site. So we'll say that the ancestor protein had an alanine at, alanine at site one. Um, and then you can do the same for site two. So you can see that uh, most species have an alanine at site two, except that these two species have an arginine. Um, again, by the principle of parsimony, uh, you could say that it's very likely uh, that the ancestor of all of these, these species had an alanine, and there was a single alanine to arginine substitution 
and the common ancestor of the two lineages that have an arginine. Um, that's the most parsimonious explanation, but it's not the only explanation. It could be that uh, the ancestor of all of the species had an arginine, and there was one, two, three, four independent mutations of that arginine to alanine. So that's four substitutions. Uh, another explanation is that it could be that um, alanine is ancestral for all of these lineages and these two species independently evolved an arginine at that site by mutating A to R, uh, but that's two substitutions. And this explanation is one substitution, which is that the common ancestor had alanine and there was one amino acid change from alanine to arginine. So one is fewer changes than two or uh, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, so by the principle of parsimony or maximum likelihood, depending on the method that you're using, we'd say that the ancestor probably had an arginine there. And then we can do the same thing for site three. Uh, again, all these species have an alanine. Only this one species has a proline. So the common ancestor of these two species likely had an alanine. And there was a single alanine to proline substitution that occurred in that lineage. Um, that occurred in that lineage. And we can do this for all kinds of proteins. Um, we don't really use parsimony anymore because while that is relatively straightforward, it can be misled by things. Um, so it can be misled by patterns like this because obviously these alanine, arginine, proline substitutions uh, that I gave in the toy example are really relatively simple and straightforward ones. Uh, but what happens when you get a pattern of alternating amino acids or where the, the amino acid substitutions don't neatly fit onto the phylogeny. Uh, parsimony can be misled by those kinds of things. So we can use other methods um, like maximum likelihood to infer those. Uh, either way, if you know the sequence of the proteins and you have a phylogeny that explains how your species are related to each other, then you can infer ancestral proteins. Um, so we did this for a bunch of mammoth proteins and then asked, do the resurrected mammoth thermotrips, these things that are responsible for the sensation of temperature, respond differently to temperature in woolly mammoths than they do in, in elephants. So while all of the thermotrips that we looked at had mammoth specific substitutions, we focused in on two. Um, one of them is this protein TRPV3, which is responsible for the sensation of warm temperatures. Uh, so this is like the Goldilocks problem. It's not too cold, it's not too hot. You're happy when it's somewhere in the middle, which is warm. So this, this channel is active at warm temperatures. And we assembled a data set of 98 TRPV3 genes from a bunch of different mammals, including a whole bunch of different living and extinct proobsidians. Um, so fortunately, there are uh, ancient genomes available, not just for mammoths, but for a bunch of other extinct, um, extinct proobsidians, like the American mastodon. So there's a mastodon genome. It's not fantastic. The quality is relatively bad, but we were able to identify the TRPV3 gene. Also this thing called the straight tusk elephant, which is a huge elephant, uh, which is most closely related to forest elephants in Africa. And the straight tusk elephant lived in uh, Europe mostly. Um, so we can compare this, these 98 TRPV3 genes for all the mammals, including a bunch of elephants and their relatives and multiple mammoths to identify mammoth specific changes in this gene. And when we did that, we found that TRPV3 has a single mammoth specific amino acid substitution in, in this gene, and it's an N647D change. So N is amino acid, 647 D, 647 is the site, and D is the derived amino acid. So in the common ancestor of mammoths, there was a single amino acid substitution in that gene at site 647 that went from asparagine to glutamine, uh, N to D. And to infer whether this single amino acid change was functional, we did that ancestral reconstruction trick to reconstruct the common ancestor of this gene from Asian elephants, and actually all the elephants, um, and the ancestral mammal. So now we have two ancestral genes, and we can compete them against each other and ask, do they function in the same way? Um, to do that, we used an assay called the FLOR4 calcium influx assay. And this is relatively simple, right? Um, so you take a bunch of cells that don't express your thermotrips. Uh, in this case, this is uh, 
kidney cells because they're not neurons, so they don't express the thermotrips. Um, then we transfect them with an expression vector for TRPV3. And then we add uh, this chemical called fluor4AM to the media. Fluor4AM can get inside the cell um, through just passive diffusion. Uh, once it's inside the cell, it gets chemically modified and it can't get back out. Uh, so there's lots of this chemical accumulating in the cell and it doesn't really do anything except that that chemical modification um, that keeps it inside the cell uh, allows it to fluoresce. So we can measure the amount of fluorescence we observe uh, as proportional to how active these thermo channels are because these are the channels that are responsible for getting the calcium outside of the cell to inside of the cell. And because this chemical, uh, the fluorescence intensity of that chemical is proportional to how much calcium is inside the cell. We can use the amount of fluorescence we observe to indicate how much calcium is getting from outside the cell to inside the cell. And this is what this actually looks like. Um, so at some stable temperature, like 30 degrees, uh, you don't get a lot of fluorescence because the channel isn't active. At a, at a hot temperature, um, the channel becomes more and more active, which lets in more and more calcium. So channel activity is proportional to the fluorescence. So bright red indicates lots of fluorescence. So lots of calcium getting into the cell. So lots of activation of these thermotrips. These pictures were taken on a very fancy microscope, uh, uh, which can, so it's, it's taking on a live cell microscope that can allow you to keep your cells alive while you're imaging them. And to keep cells alive, you need to, to, to do things like you know, keep their media healthy, um, put them in a chamber that allows you to uh, regulate uh, the humidity and the amount of CO2. And then that chamber also has to be able to change the temperature, right? You wanna dial up the temperature and dial down the temperature. Those microscopes are very expensive and we don't have one, um, but fortunately we can find a way to hack this assay because this chemical fluor4AM has the exact same uh, excitation and emission spectra, uh, excitation and emission wavelength uh, as, well, not exact, but close enough to this other chemical FITC, which we can measure in a standard um, uh, real-time PCR machine. So we can grow our cells, transfect them with the expression vector, add the calcium indicator, put them into a 96 well plate, put that plate into a PCR machine and PCR machines are really good at changing the temperatures because they have a heat source and a heat sink. So we can slowly dial up the temperature from something cold to something warm and then measure the, how much uh, calcium is being influxed into the cell by how much fluorescence it is. And when you do that, you get results that look like, like this. So what I'm showing on the X axis is the temperature increase. So going from a relatively cold temperature to a relatively hot temperature, each dot is one temperature that we measured the assay at, and these bars are the 95% confidence intervals. And on the y-axis is how much fluorescence we observe. So we observe a lot of fluorescence for the ancestral gaja, uh, which just means uh, gaja is elephant in Sanskrit. Um, so for the ancestral Asian elephant and woolly mammoth um, protein, you can see as temperatures increase, the channel becomes more active you hit some maximum and beyond that temperature, the channel becomes less active, which is what we already know. Uh, this, this channel is maximally active at warm temperatures. And then if we compare the common ancestor of Asian elephants to mammoths, we can see that the mammoth channel has the same pattern. At low temperatures, um, it becomes active. At warm temperatures, it's most active. And at hot temperatures, it decreases activity. But notice that the amount of activity between the mammoth is less than uh, the common ancestor of mammoths and Asian elephants. So we would call this, this mutation a hypermorph. So that, that single amino acid substitution in the woolly mammoth PRPV3 gene uh, reduced the sensitivity of the channel uh, to warm temperatures. Uh, so it's not as active at warm temperatures as the common ancestor was. Um, if we look, if we plot on where the protein, this is this amino acid substitution occurs, it occurs on the outside of the protein. Unfortunately, there's a crystal structure for this thing. And we can say, well, here's the structure of the protein. That's where the woolly mammoth specific amino acid substitution uh, occurred. And if we zoom up on there, we can try to infer what the consequences of that amino acid substitution may have been. Um, so here's the ancestral elephant amino acid 
Notice there aren't any yellow dots coming from it, which means it's not participating in any hydrogen bonds with the amino acids around it. While the woolly mammoth amino acid, this D at this site, does participate in amino acid substitutions around it. So it looks like one of the structural consequences of this N647D mutation in this Asian L uh, this woolly mammoth protein is that uh, it's a little more stable. So there's less wiggle room because these amino acids are bonded to each other in a way that they're not in, in elephants. And we can model the consequences of that, that little bond that's happening at the outside on the ability of the pore to open because uh, uh, we have structures of these things. So we can ask, is the woolly mammoth pore more or less open than the Asian elephant pore? So what you're looking at down the center of the channel is here is the, the trip channel, uh, the trip proteins. This is the pore that allows calcium in. This is the location of the woolly mammoth specific substitutions. And in blue is the pore size of the woolly mammoth protein. And in red is the pore size of the common ancestor of woolly mammoths in Asian elephants. And it looks like the pore is less open in Asian elephant. Uh, the pore is less open in woolly mammoths than it is in Asian elephants. And we can actually quantify that by just drawing a line down the pore and looking at how open it is. And you can see that the woolly mammoth in blue at this filter, this part up here, the pore is less open. So the hole through which calcium can influx into the cell is more closed in Asian elephants than it is, uh, more closed in woolly mammoths than it is in Asian elephants. And this is why we think the pore is less active. The hole just isn't as open as it is in uh, Asian elephants. And as a consequence of having a smaller pore, you can let less calcium in. Because if the pore is really big, then cal lots of calcium can influx into the cell. Um, which is neat, but it would also be good to be able to derive, derive some kind of phenotypic prediction. So we know that the pore is less active in um, Asian elephants, uh, less active in woolly mammoths and Asian elephants because we can do the calcium assay. Uh, we can look at the structure of the protein and come up with a pretty good explanation for why the pore might be open, uh, might be uh, functioning differently in mammoths, and that's because the pore size looks like it's smaller. Um, but that's a molecular phenotype and not uh, an organismal phenotype. So it'd be great if we could try to connect the molecular phenotype with the organismal phenotype, which again is obviously challenging because woolly mammoths are extinct. Um, so the next best thing is we can look to the literature and ask, okay, what are mice with mutations in this gene? How do they behave? Um, so if you make a mouse that has a non-functional TRPV3 protein, they prefer colder temperatures. So what you're looking at here is uh, the mouse temperature preference and or the mouse, the, the temperature at which the mice, um, the temperature at which mice spend time uh, at different temperatures and the time they spend in those temperatures. Um, so what these experiments are basically is a metal plate or metal table with a heat source in one side and a heat sink in the other side. And if you turn up the heat and down the heat on the metal table, you'll get all possible combinations of temperatures. And then you can just track where on the table the mice spend the time, spend the most time, and measure the temperature at that point in the table. And wild type mice prefer to spend most of their time at temperatures between uh, 31 degrees and 38 degrees. While mice that have a non functional TRPV3 protein spend most of their time at 20 to 25. So a mouse, which is, has a non-functional version of the TRPV3 gene, prefers colder temperatures, which suggests that woolly mammoths, which have a less functional TRPV3 gene, might also prefer colder temperatures, although we can't actually do the experiment. It's also interesting that you know, this protein TRPV3, uh, it doesn't just affect um, the sensation of temperature, it also affects how uh, hair grows. So it turns out that the TRPV3 knockout mice have wavy hair. So this is the whisker of the wild type mice, and this is the whisker of the knockout mouse. And you can see that the wild type mice have straight hair, and the whiskers are curly. And the same goes with the, the hair on the back of the ear. So in the back of the ear, wild type mice have straight hair, while the knockout mice have curly hair. So this is an example of a protein which might have had pleiotropic effects. So the mammoth protein is less functional than the Asian elephant protein, uh, which might have affected both the sensation of temperature and uh, sort of how the hair grows.
And we did this for one more thermotrip, the cold temperature sensor. So the TRPV3 protein is the warm temperature sensor. Uh, and the TRPM8 protein is the thing that detects noxious cold, so really, really cold temperatures. So we did the same thing where we collected a data set of TRPM8 genes from lots of different animals, including the living and extinct uh, elephants and their relatives. And in this case, unlike TRPV3, which had a single amino acid change, TRPM8 had six uh, woolly mammoth specific substitutions. So we did the same thing. We resurrected the ancestral protein from mammoths and the ancestral proteins from the common ancestor of mammoths and Asian elephants. And then we tested whether they were um, sensitive to different temperatures using the same 4-4 assay. And in this case, I'm showing the, the data a little differently, but it's the same kind of data. So on the x-axis is the temperature. And on the y-axis is how active the channel is, so how much fluorescence intensity we observe. Um, so you can see that as, uh, think about this as reverse. So this is the cold temperature sensor. So in the common ancestor of Asian elephants and woolly mammoths, as temperatures get colder, the, the channel becomes more and more active. And it's most active, uh, in this case, around two to five degrees. So at two to five degrees Celsius, this channel is really active. In contrast, the mammoth channel is totally insensitive to cold. Um, so no matter what temperature we tested it at, and we can only go a little bit lower, we can go down to uh, one degree or uh, one or zero. Um, we can only go so low before um, uh, the, the media that we do the test in freezes. So we can't get really low temperatures like minus five degrees um, Celsius because things start to freeze and then the assay doesn't work. Um, but at least over the, the range of temperatures that we tested, so from 37 degrees down to one degree Celsius, the mammoth cold temperature sensor channel never activates. So these, these data suggest that the mammoth channel can't be activated by cold temperature. So maybe mammoths didn't mind the cold because they didn't really sense the cold. Like if you, if you have a protein which is responsible for cold sensation and you mutate it such that it's not it, it can't be active anymore by cold temperatures. Maybe you just don't feel the cold. And again, we can look to wild type mice uh, to try to get an, an inference of whether this is the case or not. And it looks like it is. So if you make a mouse, which is a knockout, so it's non-functional for the TRPM8 protein, they prefer colder temperatures. So it's the same kind of data uh, that I showed for TRPV3. So here's the temperature. And this is the amount of time that the mice spend on that particular temperature. So you can see that the wild type mice in this uh, square red color spend most of their time around the warm temperatures that mouse prefer, while the TRPM8 mice um, don't really seem to have a preference over the warm temperatures, but spend a lot of their time at the really cold temperatures. And it also happens to be the case that there are some squirrels uh, which have a non-functional TRPM8 gene. So this is a natural mutation in squirrels. And if you look at the same kind of data generated for squirrels and compare them to mice, um, squirrels spend a lot more of their time at colder temperatures, at least squirrels which don't have this protein, spend a lot more of their time at colder temperatures than mild type mice do. So while we obviously can't do the kinds of experiments to know whether um, we'd see a similar effect in a knockout mammoth with this protein. Uh, we can at least build a circumstantial case that the thermotrips like TRPM8 is non-functional in mammoths. And based on what we know about, non about species with non-functional uh, trips like mice and, and squirrels, they don't seem to mind the cold and spend a lot more time in cold temperatures. So maybe it's the case that as a consequence of these six amino acid changes in the woolly mammoth TRPM8, uh, they didn't mind the cold, so it's not like they're sensing the extreme cold. They're just sensing the temperature of the environment, and they don't mind it so much. Um, which brings us to sort of the first level of, of conclusions, right? So it looks like genes with mully mammoth specific amino acid substitutions are enriched in functions related to temperature, temperature sensation, which is kind of a given, right? The, the mammoths live in cold, extremely cold environments. So we might expect to find that mammoth specific genetic changes have some role in the sensation of temperature. Um, what's really nice about doing these kinds of experiments is that you know we can't ask that question of mammoths 
but we know the genes are responsible for that. So we can ask the question of the genes and ask whether the genes are responsible, um, which is a simplifying assumption that relies on there being a relatively straightforward connection between the genotype and the phenotype. But at least for some of these proteins, I mean, this is basically all they do. So it's a relatively straightforward connection to make. In, in the case of woolly mammoth TRPV3, which is the warm temperature sensor, it's a hypomorph. It's less active than the, than the ancestral elephant warm temperature sensor. While in the case of TRPM8, which is the cold temperature sensor, it's completely insensitive to cold. Um, so at least over the temperatures that we tested, it looks like the, the woolly mammoth TRPM8 uh, protein just doesn't respond to cold temperature sensation. Um, so it, it looks like mammoths maybe didn't mind the cold and had a less active warm channel. And for obvious reasons, we think that these mutations may have influenced temperature preferences in woolly mammoths, but we can never really know. The best we can do is build a really circumstantial case based on the known molecular functions of these genes. And then what we can learn about the functions of these genes in model species, uh, like ground squirrels, which have a non-functional copy of M8, and mice, which have uh, knockouts of TRPV3 and TRPM8. In order to know that for sure, we'd have to be able to actually you know, resurrect a, a woolly mammoth, um, which is sort of a popular idea these days, but it raises an interesting question, right? Like, is it a good idea uh, to resurrect a woolly mammoth, even if it were possible to do so? So I tend to think that it's actually impossible to resurrect a woolly mammoth. Um, for practical reasons, right? So it's been suggested that we can use CRISPR-based genome editing to resurrect mammoths by incorporating all of the mammoth-specific genetic changes into the closest living relative of mammoths, which in this case is Asian elephants. So we can use CRISPR-based genome editing to edit the Asian elephant genome to incorporate mammoth-specific genetic changes, which are responsible for some set of mammoth-specific traits, uh, that they don't mind the cold, um, that, that makes their hair shaggy, pick your favorite trait. Um, so what these projects basically are doing is forward mutating an Asian elephant to generate, an, uh, sorry, it's forward mutating the Asian elephant genome to generate an Asian elephant with mammoth-like traits, which isn't really resurrecting a mammoth, it's sort of transforming an Asian elephant into a um, sort of a lookalike for a mammoth, which raises lots of questions. For example, which set of genes and traits are you going to do this to? Uh, there are at least 7 million genetic changes that are unique to woolly mammoths. And a bunch of those genetic changes aren't going to do anything. So how do you identify which are the ones to sort of um, incorporate into the Asian elephant genome? And beyond that, right, the, the 7 million genetic changes that are unique to woolly mammoths is an underestimate by at least a couple orders of magnitude because we're missing a whole big chunk, whole big chunks of the woolly mammoth genome. It's just not there because the, you know, the genome quality isn't great because the samples are degraded and 10,000 years old. Uh, so what happens if some of those changes which are required to make an, uh, a mammoth a mammoth are in the part of the genome that's missing? So how would you ever identify those, right? Um, and how many genetic changes are required to transmutate your Asian elephant into a mammoth? Is it one, is it two, is it a hundred, is it a hundred thousand? Um, that increases the, the probability that you're technically gonna hit limitations, uh, but it also sort of raises a philosophical challenge, which is, you know, what makes a species a species? Is it all the genetic changes that are unique to that species, or is it all the genetic changes that are unique to that species that also happen to contribute to species specific genetic, uh, species specific morphological traits and behavioral traits and physiological traits? And if you're going to resurrect a resurrect mammoth, which sets of ones do you go after? And are some of those uh, genetic changes more important or more essential than other sets? of genetic changes. And if we think about these questions in the context of uh, mammoth temperature biology, for example, maybe you could argue that, well, what you want to do is mutate the Asian elephant TRPV3 gene to incorporate the mammoth specific genetic change because it's only one change, right? So it's practically not that challenging to CRISPR up a single genetic change in a genome. Um, and with this one change, maybe you can make a cold tolerant hairy Asian elephant because this change is associated changes in temperature sensation in mice and uh, fur biology in mice. 
which is an interesting idea, but there are challenges with that. Um, it might not work, right? Uh, so beneficial mutations occur in a background of genetic changes in species that includes all of the other species specific mutations. So genetic changes occur not in isolation, but in a background of an evolutionary history, which isn't present in Asian elephants. And it is present in mammoths, it's just that mammoths are extinct. Um, we know, for example, that these mutations can interact with other mutations through epistasis. Um, so it could be that you might select some genetic changes that you want to take from the Asian elephant, uh, from the woolly mammoth, and incorporate into the Asian elephant genome. And they don't actually do anything when you put them in the Asian elephant genome because they require other epistatically interacting mutations for their functional effects. Or it could be even worse. Um, so we know that uh, epistatic interactions between the genetic changes uh, in the genome can either enhance or dampen the negative consequences of mutations. So it could be that there are a whole bunch of genetic changes unique to elephant, uh, unique to woolly mammoths that don't look functional on their own, but what they do is reduce the negative consequences of other mutations. And in the context of TRPV3, this is actually something that I suspect is happening. So it seems like a less functional TRPV3 might be good for cold tolerance, right? So when we make when we look at the function of the mammoth TRPV3 protein, it's less active than the, the common ancestor protein was. Um, and maybe that that less active channel allows mammoths to be more tolerant of cold conditions. But it also turns out that TRPV3 mutations cause disease. Uh, in particular, there's a disease called Olmsted syndrome, which is a relatively rare genetic disorder uh, in, in, uh, caused by amino acid changes in the TRPV3 gene. And this genetic disorder is associated with uh, epidermal thickening, permanent hair loss, and severe itching. Um, so if you wanna make a mammoth out of an Asian elephant and you incorporate this single genetic change in TRPV3, maybe you'll make a, an Asian elephant that is more tolerant of cold temperatures. But as a consequence, you might also make a, a, an Asian elephant which has thin, which is uh, skin, which is too thick, which eventually loses its hair and is constantly itching. And you know, for these reasons and many, many others, I think it's sort of silly to suggest that uh, resurrecting mammoths is something that we should be doing, even though it kind of would be fun to be able to do so. Just, you know, uh, I, for one, would like to be able to see a mammoth, but it, it doesn't mean that it's a good idea to do so. And with that, uh, I'll get off my soapbox about why resurrecting mammoths is probably a silly idea and more of a vanity project than an actual scientific endeavor. Um, and, uh, yeah. and, and just say that even if you can identify the mutations responsible for mammoth specific traits, um, identifying all the mutations responsible for mammoth specific traits may not be possible. And it may become more difficult the more complex the genotype genotype map is. Um, so even if it becomes technically able to do so through genome editing, practically it doesn't seem like we're ever really going to be able to resurrect the mammoth. The best we'll ever be able to do is make an Asian elephant that looks like a mammoth. And this is where my topology comes out. Uh, I don't ever call that an Asian elephant, uh, a woolly mammoth. I wouldn't call it a resurrected mammoth. I call it a shaggy Asian elephant. Um, and with that, I'd like to you know, thank the people who did the work, in particular, uh, the people who sequenced the genomes, uh, the people who did the paleobiochemistry experiments, uh, more people who sequenced genomes, uh, people who give us money, because you know, uh, we can't do any of these things without money. And I'd really like to thank the postdoc who did the, the TRPV3 and M8 experiments, Mike Sulek, uh, who was the one who figured out how to hack the PCR machine. Uh, to do these experiments without spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on a, a very fancy live cell imaging microscope. Um, and with that, I'll thank you and take questions if you have any. Thank you very much, Vinny. Uh, it's great to know that you can go to such fine detail about, you know, the, the width of the canal and, and all that, that detailed structural Explanation, thank you very much. I bet lots of our colleagues here are very interested in canals and all of that. So there we have Cecilia has a question for you. Yeah, I wanted to ask uh, about any other mutations that could uh, work on the physiology because yeah, the TRP mutations 
make them more comfortable at those cold temperatures. But what about many other <laughs> systems that need to work correctly at those temperatures? Yeah, so this is why I think that identifying all of the genetic, all of the genetic changes that are responsible for adaptation to extreme colds is challenging and might not actually be possible. So these are only two, and presumably there are very many. Um, so for example, neurons work less well when they're cold because you know, the way that uh, electrical engineering works. So maybe some of the other things that they had to do is have, find better ways of transmitting uh, electrical impulses to the long nerves, or you know, blood gets thick when it's cold. That's one of the reasons that there's uh, uh, changes in the hemoglobin that have been previously identified. So these two genetic changes are just two. And I think there's gonna be a bunch of others. We haven't functionally characterized, um, we functionally characterized some of the others, but not all of them. And I don't know that we'll ever really be able to uh, for two reasons. One, practically it's very challenging to do the kinds of experiments that one would need to do. Um, you have to find like the right reductionist uh, experimental system. And that might not work doing this very reductive thing that we did for TRPV3 and M8 for all kinds of proteins. And the other is that there's big chunks of the elephant, uh, big chunks of the mammoth genome that are missing because of you know, it being an ancient DNA sample. And there are probably genetic changes important for mammothness in those missing bits. And we'll never know that they're missing because they're, they're not there. Yeah. So I think it's absolutely the case. This is only two of potentially very many changes that are responsible for making mammoths mammoths. Although I would like to identify all of the changes that are responsible for making mammoths mammoths. <laughs> yes, thank you. May I comment? You you said that uh, the average tem the temperature is about thirty eight degrees. Uh, I guess that's from isotopes, right? Oxygen isotopes or something like that. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's a pretty hard fact, and and that means that they they rarely went cold. I I I, I guess you know they they have so many adaptations, <laughs> and I and that's what makes the so much sense to me that they would not feel the call, you know? It, it, your explanation is, is the only reasonable explanation. I think I, I totally buy it, although you cannot, <laughs> because uh, you have all these adaptations for call that would be like, let's say a waste not to go over there where the resources are because you're just feeling cold, but you actually can resist right. all that, all that re resists a uh, uh, very, very cold temperature. So desensitization it makes a lot of sense when you're, you're colonizing, right? And, and have all these adaptations for an extremely uh, cold environment. Great adaptations, you know, a lot of a hump of brown fat on your back and the yep. hair and, and all the stuff that we know, I guess, from frozen specimens of the, the, that soft tissue and in information. Yep. So, so yeah, it, would, it, it makes uh, a lot of sense to me. Your discovery makes a lot of sense to me. So I, I, yeah, and I, this is where the hand waviness comes in, right? So I like to imagine, even though I have no absolute, absolute way of doing that, of doing this evolutionary storytelling thing, right? Um, so you evolve, the mammoths evolve to like and be insensitive to cold places. Um, so, you know, mammoths wanna be in cold places and the, war, the world is getting warmer and warmer. So what do you do if you're an animal that likes to be cold and the world is getting warmer and warmer? you have to migrate to the colder and colder places. But like, you know, the Arctic is there as a, there's an ocean there, there's a sea there. You can only go so far north. Beyond that, you can't migrate to anywhere where it's colder. So in a warming world, you might just end up in a, a situation where mammoths like the cold, the world is getting warmer and they have nowhere left to go. And that might have contributed to their extinction. Although I have absolutely no way of proving any of that. Yeah, I think Cecilia had another question or you? No, I was no, just I getting my hat down. Okay, okay, yeah. Yes, I, I think we have the these uh, most recent, I think they found now some mammals have survived until 6,000 years ago, I think. Yeah. In some specially called places, <laughs> which makes sense to me. But at least those, their populations, and we're getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller over a very long time. So the process of extinction in mammoths probably wasn't very fast. It was like a slow fuse extinction. They were slowly burning out, and then there was just none left. <laughs>
well, I want to thank you also for, for talking about this de-extinction thing. Your, your research in itself was uh, fascinating. Uh, uh, but I asked Vinny to also comment on, on this stuff about the, the de-extinction. So you are very right about this uh, mitigating other, you know, uh, genes context that, uh, that have also, that makes it difficult to go just on a gene by gene uh, basis, right? Like uh, I was just remembering this new paper that came out, stellar the stellar cow, the stellar sea cow that became oh yeah, extinct. Yep. Yeah, and so they say it has the mutation that, that in humans is uh, very catastrophic, right? That would that it leads to harlequin. Uh, what's the ichthyosis? Harlequin ichthyosis. Yep. Your, your skin is extremely keratinized. I think that's the problem, and it tends to crack and open, and that will happen yep. to you if you're a human. But these had a, a very thick bark-like skin. These animals, but they must have had right a very different genomic context in which this doesn't lead to lethal cracking and all the horrible things that it leads. The same mutations, right? Because it, it basically right. in humans lead to all of this. But uh, so this this would be similar to what you said right about. Yeah, that absolutely. Maybe so that, presumably that, some other genetic changes buffered the negative consequences of those exactly. even and allowed the, the sort of adaptive effects of those mutations to come out. A very, you know, a basic context dependency, a completely yep. uh, common biological phenomenon. But people like to speculate, you know, and say, oh, if we have the biotechnology to do it. We can do it and kind of forget about the biology and the natural history of, yeah. of, of the, the natural history matters. Exactly. Okay, do we have any other questions for Vinny? I think maybe if there's anybody on YouTube that left a question, I'm checking out. People uh, maybe because it's in English we have a a, a bit a bit of a, a low, lower assistance, but <laughs> I'm sure that the, <laughs> that people will be checking. My Spanish out. would have been less understandable. <laughs> yeah, no, certainly. I've been in situations where people <laughs> strive, and uh, in the end, it's it's better just to to go with the English. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Vinny. I ha I had a great time. I loved your your presentation. It's always good seeing you, Alex. I think it's yes. a great example of how how topics can go, you know, deep and into this kind of molecular details uh, that that uh, connecting you know, to evolutionary questions and and things like that. So I think your 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 seminar was a very neat uh, example of where what what this integrative approach can lead us and the level of molecular detail that we can. That we can achieve. So I, I really, I really like it. Always good to have compliments. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thanks, Vinny. Uh, if there's no more questions, then we'll see you guys next uh, Wednesday. Nos vemos el próximo miércoles en el próximo seminar. Cuídense todo. Bye bye. Take care, Vinny. Nice to see you again. Ciao, ciao.